We have uh, some National Space Council Users Advisory Group questions and answers. Our moderator uh, for this afternoon is Dr. Mary Lynn Dittmar. Afternoon. Maybe that's just because I've been up since 3 a.m. So it's still only 1045. <laughs> Dr. Mary Lynn Dittmar is president and CEO of the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration and the Space Studies Board of the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. In June of 2018, she was appointed by NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein to the Users Advisory Group of the National Space Council and was then appointed by Department of Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow to the Department of Transportation, Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee. She is a capable lady and uh, with a very exciting panel. Please make them feel welcome. So, um, good morning to all of you. Uh, appreciate you hanging around for the policy panel, staying awake. Did you get your coffee? Just want to make sure. Um, well, I want to introduce my uh, fellow panelists. Um, I don't have their bios in front of me. Um, Dave Thompson here on my immediate left. Um, Dave has an ex a distinguished, very distinguished um, career in aerospace. He's the founder of Orbital Sciences. Um, parlayed that company up into a Fortune 500 and eventually became part of Northrop Grumman a bit ago. So um, very welcome to, to have you. And then my other colleague and friend, Dave, um, Eric, Eric Stalmer. Eric is the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. So we're here today representing the Users Advisory Group of the National Space Council. And the way that we're gonna do this is we're just gonna talk very briefly about what the Users Advisory Group is, um, all of the organizations that it interfaces with, what it's supposed to be doing, um, we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of the subcommittees that are on that are that make up the users um, advisory group. There are actually several of them, but we're really just going to focus on a couple that are relevant to this conference. Um, and then we're going to open up to you. Um, the UAG has been doing a series of these listening sessions um, across the United States for about the last nine months where we uh, gratefully accept uh, invitations to come to conferences and have a chance to interact with folks that are in the community. And so that's really the purpose of this today, is not for us to preach at you so much, um, but for you to be able to ask us questions. So I'm gonna move on. So the National Space Council uh, was stood up, as, as many of you know, about a year and a half ago. Uh, it was a revitalization of a previous body that last was uh, active during the, the Bush administration. And the Users Advisory Council, the, sorry, the Users Advisory Group was set up to advise and provide input into the National Space Council. So the National Space Council interacts with NASA uh, for administrative work mostly. We're not a part of NASA. We don't take direction from NASA. We don't give direction to NASA. Uh, we also interact with ourselves. So there's, as I said, a, a number of committees. Other entities that we work with include DOD, uh, industry, we're uh, very much an industry representative body, scientific community. We have outreach efforts that include existing venues, so the uh, National Space Society, IAC, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, uh, all of these have sort of already interacted with us and will continue to interact with them. There are no issues that are off limits for the user's advisory group. So we don't have a constraint. We're not told ever that, no, you can't ask those questions or no, you can't go there with those inquiries. And the chairman, who is Admiral Jim Ellis, he convenes with the National Space Council if we do not. And what's simply meant by that is that he has more interactions more frequently with the National Space Council than can the entire body of the UAG. So the description of our duties you can read the slide uh, to ensure that the interests of industry, other non-federal entities, and other persons that are involved in aeronautical and space activities are adequately represented to the National Space Council, to provide subject matter expertise to the Council, to submit findings and recommendations to the Council, to conduct studies, reviews, and evaluations as requested by the Council, and to submit an annual report to the Council on our activities as reported by the Council. So one thing I want to make clear is that the UAG is not a policy-making body. Uh, we do not make policy. We don't even recommend policy very strongly. However, we do raise issues that we think that the National Space Council needs to be aware of. 
The construct are these subcommittees that I mentioned before. We're gonna to talk today a little bit about the Exploration and Discovery Committee, and then also the Economic Development and Industrial Base Committee that Eric chairs along with me. Then the Executive Committee is made up of the subcommittee chair. So it's a straightforward organizational construct. Okay, each one of the subcommittees has a chair. Those chairs make up the Executive Committee, and that's chaired then by Admiral Ellis. So our brief discussion today, three of the subcommittees, um, I'm gonna ask Dave talk a little bit about exploration and discovery, and ask Eric to talk about economic development and industrial base, and I'm gonna come back and just say a word or two about the technology and, and, uh, and innovation subcommittee, and then what we'll end up doing is opening the floor to you. So, Dave, you wanna take it away? Okay. Okay, well thanks, thanks Mary Lynn, and good morning everyone. Um, maybe just a, a little more background on uh, the National Space Council and how it's a bit different this time around than, than in the past. The, the Space Council actually got started under, uh, during the Eisenhower administration, and it was pretty active during quite a bit of the 1960s under Presidents uh, Kennedy and Johnson, and it continued uh, for uh, a few years under President Nixon, and then it was uh, largely uh, disbanded and its uh, uh, charter handed over to uh, other, uh, other offices in, uh, in the White House. It was revived uh, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s under President Bush 41, uh, went away again uh, for a while, and then has, as Mary Lynn said, uh, has come back uh, uh, beginning about 18 months ago uh, with, the current, uh, with the current administration. This time around, though, unlike uh, in the past, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Space Council um, uh, has an uh, advisory group uh, representing the major uh, groups of uh, uh, users of uh, space technology and systems, and uh, you're probably mostly interested in, in uh, two of those, uh, human space uh, flight uh, activities and uh, space science activities. So the, the f first of the six uh, subcommittees that we've divided uh, ourselves into really concerns uh, those, those areas. And the exploration and discovery membership is, uh, is listed here. And so, um, uh, at, uh, I guess, our first organizational meeting that occurred about a year ago, Scott Pace, who's the executive director of the Space Council, uh, gave us some homework assignments, and a couple of those naturally fell under uh, uh, this uh, subcommittee's uh, purview. Uh, and uh, one of those, which is uh, listed here, um, uh, I'll, I'll maybe reformulate it a little bit uh, it's because it's evolved a bit since uh, we got started. At the, at the outset, though, the, the question that was posed to this subcommittee, or one of the two, was how can NASA accelerate the U.S.'s uh, return to the moon? Um, and that's an area where uh, there has been some significant uh, progress in the recent months, as I think you all know, uh, back in March. Um, NASA was given uh, the high-level mandate to uh, uh, rethink its uh, approach to uh, lunar exploration such that we, we can put people back on the moon within about five years. And I think this is injecting some much-needed uh, urgency into not only the agency's uh, uh, behavior, but that of its uh, industry partners as well. Uh, what uh, some of the things that I think are needed to, to accomplish this include uh, opening up a some, somewhat broader set of technical and programmatic options for how we go about uh, returning to the moon, uh, looking at, uh, as, as you've all read, uh, uh, scaling back, at least in the near term, uh, the, uh, or, or removing from the critical path the lunar orbit gateway. Uh, using a mix of uh, different launch vehicles to uh, uh, position the necessary uh, landing systems uh, uh, in lunar orbit or in other uh, convenient locations, and also adopting uh, more flexible um, business models and contracting approaches to implement this program. A second area that, that uh, 
you heard Jim uh, Mazur address a little earlier this morning was the likely need for some amount of additional funding uh, to NASA's budget over the coming years. Um, um, on top of roughly the $100 billion or so that the agency was planning to spend, another 5 or 10 percent may be needed on top of that to, uh, to implement this, uh, this uh, accelerated program. And then finally, I think uh, a change in culture, uh, both at NASA and, and, and in the industry, will be needed to, uh, to carry this uh, program out. So the, the advisory group will continue to provide uh, our uh, suggestions uh, to the Space Council to uh, see that this, uh, uh, this accelerated uh, return to the moon uh, has the best chance of succeeding. Another um, topic that uh, uh, Scott Tapace asked us to look into beginning about a year ago is, uh, is listed here, and I would probably summarize this as uh, uh, in the following question, what new types of space-based science uh, missions can be enabled or enhanced um, by piggybacking on the new uh, human lunar space uh, infrastructure that the country is going to develop and put into operation over the coming years? Um, space-based science is one of the big four users of space, so I'm particularly uh, excited to see uh, this uh, area getting, uh, getting a good deal of um, attention. And uh, there, this is an area that's been studied for a long time. Uh, the National Academies have sponsored a number of reports. For instance, if you go back uh, about 10 years, uh, there, was a, there was a very comprehensive study of lunar surface science that could be carried out uh, um, uh, once, once uh, autonomous systems as well as uh, uh, human explorers return to, uh, return to the moon. And there are certainly other areas in heliophysics and planetary exploration that could benefit from this new uh, lunar infrastructure that's being put in place uh, as well. In discussing this, though, uh, over, the, over the past year with, in a variety of uh, settings somewhat like this with uh, uh, um, scientific experts, uh, two particularly exciting possibilities have emerged, uh, neither, neither of which uh, are completely original ideas. In fact, one goes back quite a long ways. But with modern approaches to the way they would be implemented, uh, these two areas, I think, have a great deal of, uh, a great deal of potential uh, over the course of the next decade to, uh, to enhance uh, our understanding of the universe, and in particular, uh, our search for life on, uh, on other worlds. Uh, the first of these, uh, an idea that stretches back uh, at least 50 years, uh, involves the deployment of a radio telescope array on the far side of the moon. The, as most of you can imagine, the far side is, from a radio frequency standpoint, the quietest place within you know, several light years of Earth. And uh, so it's an ideal place for a low-frequency radio telescope that can address not only some fundamental questions uh, about the, uh, the uh, early uh, evolution of the universe, but also uh, can, sh can uh, provide some very important insights into the habitability of uh, the many exoplanets that we're discovering around uh, other star systems. And with... Uh, um, novel approaches to how such a radio telescope could be, could be deployed. Uh, um, once we have uh, both autonomous and uh, human landers uh, uh, going back to the surface of the moon, uh, this, this appears to be something that could be done pretty, uh, pretty uh, expeditiously and for, uh, by space program standards, uh, a relatively modest investment. The second area, also one that's been contemplated for a long time, involves the construction and, and uh, deployment of very large aperture optical and UV telescopes uh, in um, uh, desirable locations, uh, particularly the L2 uh, point in the Earth-Sun system. Very large in this uh, context means uh, 
uh, telescopes with apertures that will rival the largest ones that we're likely to have on the surface of the Earth towards the end of the next decade, uh, 25 plus meter uh, diameter uh, in space telescopes. And these would, among other uh, uh, features, allow for uh, direct imaging of uh, exoplanets uh, around uh, uh, hundreds of uh, relatively nearby stars. These telescopes, uh, however, being so large and uh, being difficult to launch all in one piece, are likely to benefit from in-space assembly and servicing and upgrades using some of the same uh, transportation and in-space infrastructure that we uh, are developing now and that will uh, uh, evolve uh, with uh, the lunar program over the course of, uh, of the coming uh, decade. So those are two of the, uh, the, the particular topics that this uh, committee has uh, focused on, and maybe we can come back and talk about those in a little bit, but let me now move, uh, move things on to Eric, and he'll tell you about a couple of the other uh, committees. <clears throat> thank you so much, Dave, and thank you, Mary Lynn, for, uh, for sharing this. So the Economic and Development Industrial Base uh, Committee is a really uh, eclectic group of uh, leaders from throughout the industry, as you can see, uh, from ULA to SpaceX to Blue Origin, uh, and Alabama's represented in some of the uh, newer entrants, uh, relativity space. Uh, as Dave gave a pretty good overview of um, the history of the National Space Council, uh, my history of the National Space Council was very limited. When I, when I got into the, uh, the space industry um, in the 90s, the National Space Council went away. So everyone always talked about the National Space Council and, and for you know, every presidential campaign, you know, on both sides, they said, we need to get a National Space Council together. And I wasn't really sure what it did um, during those different administrations. Um, but I can kind of you know, shed some light on what, what I'm seeing, what, what Mary Lynn is seeing, um, and, and Dave, uh, on the, uh, the work that's being done and, and the, I guess the level of enthusiasm uh, that, uh, that we're seeing. Uh, as I said, it was about a year and a half ago when, when they stood this up. Um, and I think this is, uh, you know, it's headed up by Vice President Pence, and I would argue to say it's probably one of the top priorities uh, for the Vice President. You know, obviously, he has many uh, priorities on his plate, but the level of attention that he and his staff have given, um, the level of access that the, the National Space Council uh, staff, uh, led by uh, Scott Pace and his team over there, um, the intent, uh, attentiveness that they, they have had on, on our issues ha has just been fantastic. So, uh, you know, at first it, it seemed like a, a slow boat turning, but, uh, but now that it's turning and, and the, the meetings and the briefings that we're having, uh, I, I'm seeing a lot of traction in it, and it gives me a lot of enthusiasm for the work that we're doing. Uh, like Dave said, you know, we were given um, a lot of uh, topics, you know, various areas. If you talk about industrial base uh, or economic development, industrial base, I think, uh, you know, it became a little clearer why Mary Lynn and I uh, were tasked to co-chair this committee. Uh, Mary Lynn with, with her coalition of scores of different companies and my organization, you know, with, with the many uh, and diverse companies that we have, we really have to put a lot of attention on what our companies are doing, what they can do, and, and what we should be doing. And, and I think this is, this is a great um, opportunity for us, especially uh, in the areas that we're focusing on in low Earth orbit, the commercialization of low Earth orbit. What are the next steps uh, that we should be looking at uh, and, and taking it, and how do we utilize the, the strengths that the government has to, to encourage and facilitate um, the work that the, uh, the various companies are, are, are providing. So what, what's been very helpful for us um, on the, the Economic Development Committee is to be receiving briefings from all different organizations uh, on what they're doing and how how we can do it better. So I think it was just last week we had um, a briefing from uh, the organization that used to be CASIS, the International or ISS National Labs. And they gave an overview of, of how they see the growth uh, and the investment that they're putting in and where that growth is going, uh, the variety and the diversity of companies that are, that are investing and in doing work on the International Space Station. 
Uh, and, and also we, we talk about the, what that means for the life of the International Space Station. How can we, uh, as, as time is ticking, I shouldn't say it that way, but as you know, the, the, the expected life uh, of the ISS, do we extend that? Or how do we parlay the, uh, the, the, you know, the precious NASA dollars that they have on, on kind of encouraging the next steps as we're talking about going on to the moon uh, and beyond? Uh, you know, how do we, you know, with the $20 billion and ho hopefully this $1.6 billion addition, we'll see, uh, and what that can mean. Uh, we also talked to NASA on what their plans are. What are, what are your plans in low Earth orbit and, and where do we fit in on that? Uh, and then we, you know, from the, the NASA Advisory Council, we had a very good brief uh, on what they're doing uh, and how our efforts can parlay uh, on, on those issues. Um, I can tell you, though, that um, from our experience on, as the, uh, the, the chair of this committee, of our interaction with the vice president um, and with the president, that space is really a top priority. Um, I, I don't want to name drop here, but I'm totally going to. But when, when Mary Lynn and I were at the, the White House uh, about three weeks ago or so, and the vice president came in, and there was just a handful of us there, uh, he made it very clear what the president's uh, goals were. And the first one he said was uh, that he wanted to go to Mars, and he was very committed to going to Mars. And I think people said, well, before we get to Mars, maybe the moon. And so the, the focus on that shift is uh, on the moon and, and what we're going to do to achieve that in 2024. And as we're seeing the rollout of how that's happening, I think it's very exciting. But there's, there is a tremendous commitment by this administration on that. So the topics on this, the other one, oh, I went ahead a little bit. The other one we're looking at, if I just go back um, uh, on the the focus areas, the, the other one uh, hot potato that we uh, got handled, uh, handed on this committee is spectrum uh, and the critical need uh, and organization of our, our spectrum. And uh, I made it very clear at the outset, and, and Mary Lynn concurred, that neither one of us were experts on spectrum. And, uh, but what we were able to do was, was bring in those experts out there, the folks that are working day in, day out on spectrum issues, uh, and try to find consensus on what the problems were, what the issues were, and how can, um, how can we address this. And, I, and we submitted a white paper uh, to the Space Council on what we think the, the key areas are. But these are growing documents. These are living documents that, uh, as Mary Lynn and, and Dave said, is that the whole reason why we're here today, why, why what we're doing is to be an ear to the ground, to industry, uh, to the community on what, what are the big problems that we should be facing, ta tackling? Um, how can, what are the recommendations we can make uh, and the impact that we can have? Again, we don't make policy, um, but we certainly can um, uh, highlight what some of the policy areas that should be addressed are, and I think we've, we've been very effective on that. There's been four space policy directives um, that are, uh, I think, in line with a lot of the, the vision uh, of the, the space community. So uh, that's, those are some of the key areas that we're, we're looking at. But there, you know, our plate is never too full. It, it is too full, I should say, but we're always taking on more, more issues. And that's why we, we like to do events like this so we can hear from the public on, on what the, uh, the key priorities are and if we're, if we're missing anything. So with that, I'll turn it over, back over to you, Mary Lennon. Get going. Thank you, Dave. I'm just going to touch briefly on the a last committee that I know has relevance to some folks here. It's very focused on technology development. Um, these are the, the folks that are on that committee, and it's chaired by, um, by Pam Milroy, who uh, has a great deal of experience in technology development. She was at DARPA um, for some time as the deputy of the technical technology development, and um, was a former astronaut. and. Uh, they spent some time in Australia helping the Australians set up their space agency. So the, the, that committee has had a couple of telecons. Actually, since this has, uh, this, these slides were put together, they've done a little bit more. And their real focus right now is on developing a space technology roadmap. Um, there is one. It uh, was done several years ago, actually, with NASA and the National Academies. Um, a lot of this, this conversation is very... Um, very well situated here at the National Academies because the Academies has interacted a great deal and supports a great deal of the development of U.S. Um, space policy. So the technology roadmap was put together several years ago and it needs to be updated. So one of the things that's happening now is that Pam and her committee are interacting with the Academies and then also with others um, to talk about how it is that you frame that technology roadmap update. 
Um, as you can think about it, technology development, as it touches on space exploration, space science, space commerce, um, it basically underlies all of those things. And so one of the biggest problems facing the community, this committee is how do you bound it? Um, you know, where, where is it that we want to focus in terms of looking at, at space technology development? And then the second one is space data as a U.S. government capability versus buying it as a service. Some of you may have been following the discussions. Is there more, is there more and more data gathering capability that now exists inside the commercial sector? Um, how is it that the United States makes best use of that data as it's available? Do you want to be buying it as a service? Do you need the government to produce it? Well, in some cases, yes. In other cases, a service is probably better. How do you structure that entire discussion going forward? And so they're looking at that. Um, also focused on regulation uh, that encourages innovation with um, basically necessary commonality. And the point there is essentially, if you have great ideas about innovating and developing new technologies, as soon as you start talking about standardizing that or having to meet some standards, you're introducing some constraints. So how is it that you bound that? You know, how do you encourage innovation, um, structure regulation so that it encourages innovation, opens the door to innovation, but doesn't over-constrain it? Um, and then they're developing a list of game-changing technologies. So that's sort of our short version um, of three of the committees that are currently engaged on the, on the UAG. Um, we want to know what you think. I mean, you can read the slides. What do you think we should know? What are your concerns? What are your thoughts? Um, what, should be, what should we be considering or paying attention to? Um, I also want to make a note of the fact that you can submit on your own, this is open to the public, comments and questions, white papers, okay, using this email address, it's hq-uag at mail.nasa.gov. Um, I do want to note that the submissions are open, so they're uh, basically available to anybody to have a look at. So if there's proprietary or confidential information, you absolutely should not um, submit it versus that 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 avenue because it will be seen. And then there's also more information that's available at the UAG, basically at this website here. So if you just Google um, Users Advisory Group National Space Council, it'll take you pretty much right to that, that page. So um, I think I'd like to stop now and, and just ask if there are questions. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, my question involves long-term planning for Mars. Uh, long-term to me is uh, over 100 years. And so what I'm asking about is uh, what uh, is going on at the NSC about uh, terraforming Mars and using Mars. You know, it's one thing to go to Mars, and this organization here is uh, very focused and concentrated on getting to Mars and using the moon as it should be to go to Mars, and that's great. But uh, uh, I worked on the Apollo program, and I lived in the Apollo era, and noted that uh, we did have a follow-on Apollo uh, program, but because of uh, a lack of budget, and that was because of a lack of plans, uh, nothing happened, and here we are 50 years later. Uh, so I would hate to see the same thing happen to Mars, um, and, and to me, a long-term plan for using Mars once we get there, and uh, possibly... Uh, uh, starting to terraform Mars and having the visibility that Mars really can be a planet you can live on uh, would be a, a very good promotional activity and to get to Mars in the first place. And uh, so the, the basic question is, does the NSC have a, uh, an arm looking at uh, long-term planning for Mars and namely terraforming? And that includes science and inter infrastructure and everything else. Okay, so right now, no, um, in a word. Um, the, the focus of the National Space Council, we probably should have said this a little bit when we were talking about the National Space Council. One of the goals of the National Space Council is to actually try and engender a whole of government approach as much as possible um, to deal with a lot of the issues in space because they do tend to cut across multiple agencies. So as I'm sure you're aware, um, there have been discussions in science circles for some time, as well as technology development and infrastructure circles about what is involved in actually when you get somewhere, right? So there is a whole lot of discussion about how to get there, but what are you gonna do when you get there? Um, and so at the moment, because the focus is 
on the moon as that stepping stone to go to Mars. And there's so many challenges just to get to the moon, right? We're still working on architecture, as Dave mentioned earlier, right? I mean, what, what, what's the approach? What are we gonna do when we get there? There's a lot of discussion about being able to process raw materials on the moon, but the fact of the matter is that we still have a ton of prospecting work to do there before we even know really exactly what we're dealing with. So I think the idea is to think about the moon as what can we learn from it? Not all of the lessons that we'll learn on the moon are applicable to Mars. Um, what is it that we can learn there that is applicable to Mars? So there are long-term thinkers, but as a policy matter at the moment, there's not a lot of focus on this. Mm -hmm. and, we'll definitely take the input. And just to echo what, what Mary Lynn said uh, on the, the structure and the makeup of, of the Space Council, the idea, I, you know, as it was first laid out, was issues that, um, you know, a Mars issue may focus in, in NASA's lane. Um, but when the, these issues kind of cross over to the different uh, agencies and different departments, um, how, how do we find resolve with that? And, and the Space Council as a whole, you know, working on those issues, the, the, um, the Space Force was, was one of those that had many different um, uh, agencies that, or departments that you know, were impacted. But, you know, and I think it has evolved a little bit uh, from the conflicts to more of the, the opportunities that, that they see, you know, when the Space Council gets together. Um, and I think that's re refreshing in, in, in that aspect, that it's not the, you know, the infighting between transportation and commerce. It's where, where's the common ground and, and where should the, the end state be? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Got Good morning. a question about the technology roadmaps. And I, I agree, it's probably time to revisit them. When you do, how do you try to categorize them so that they're not, don't have embedded architectural decisions in them? And by that I mean things like cryo transfer or cryo storage or artificial gravity. Those are areas where there's research that's needed, but it's not necessarily applicable to all architectures. So how do we keep from locking ourselves into one course and ignoring potentially others that may emerge? I do a quick call on this just because I've talked to Pam about it. Um, sh sh and then I'm certainly gonna throw it open to others. That both what you say, okay, which is to bake in the assumptions about architectures, that's one problem. The flip side is how do you bound it, right? So that you're not trying to tackle every conceivable possible relevant technology. And all I can tell you right now, I wish Pam was up on the stage, is that that's the conversation they're having exactly right now. So the, the subcommittee is aware um, of, of those issues and how is it that you drive it, right? So that you are able to define the way that you're gonna look at that roadmap so that you A, don't do what you're suggesting as a possibility, which then drives the entire technology roadmap in that direction and potentially you lose things that you should not be losing um, versus opening the thing up so that now you're all over the map, right? And you never get the study done. So, um, Kudos for putting your finger on uh, on one of those key, on one of those key issues, and they are struggling right now. Well, I don't say struggling, but they're having a discussion. They're making some progress, but they're having a discussion right now about exactly how to do that. Okay, thank you much. Yep. All right. Well, thank you for um, taking a look at asking people to provide information on um, groundbreaking technologies, and we appreciate that. And particularly with our next speaker, who's talking about how blockchain can impact humans to Mars and space exploration, what, do you get, what are you doing to get the word out to non-traditional players? Because there are an awful lot of, we've seen as we were planning this conference and we've been speaking to over the last year, a lot of different non-traditional companies that could really have this groundbreaking technology, but they're not actually aware of their opportunities to engage with the space community. And we're seeing a lot of great ideas, but I think there's just a lot, a, a lot of people don't know they can actually contribute. So what are you doing to get the word out to them that maybe you have the idea that might actually solve a big problem that we've been trying to figure out for years within the space community? That's a great question. I think what, as we do these type of events, you know, our, our, our spheres continue to grow a little bit with the different organizations. What, what might be the right answer? The, the, the certain group with AIAA is, is different, you know, with the, the Mars group. Uh, one of the areas that we look to those non-traditional or not, um, uh, you know, space, you know, related companies is the Silicon Valley. 
and where the investments are and where that, that, that type of new innovation. And we're getting the word out to, to that area. And, and sometimes it's geographical to, to talk about these things and you know, for Wall Street to know where we are and those investors. So I think it's a lot, a lot has to do with the investment community of um, getting the word out on what we're doing. And we're, we're trying really uh, hard with that, you know, of getting our message out. And, and again, I, I, talking with the, the, uh, the user advisory group hat on, but also, you know, for what Mary Lynn and I do, you know, this, having these large coalition of companies um, that aren't always traditional, uh, you know, space providers uh, and, and the, the type of um, interaction they have with other uh, businesses, you know, the blockchain, I'm, I'm, I've always very, been very fascinated with that uh, and how that may relate to it. So I think we're, we're trying that effort, but um, there's 20 some of us uh, on the 22 or 25 on, on the committee, and, and we try to spread ourselves out at, at many of these uh, different types of events just to kind of get the message out on, on how we want to engage and, and get more people uh, and areas engaged with it. Um, the another thing that we've done, Chris, is that we're actually trying to emphasize also young people. Um, so we've done a couple of uh, events that have been um, related to university work. And then uh, Admiral Ellis and I have done some work with the Space Generation Advisory Council. Um, Eric's group is also very involved with them. We met with them at the International Astronautical Congress in Bremen um, last year and had extensive conversations. And that's a global, for those of you that aren't familiar with the SJAC, um, it's a global organization. It's affiliated with the UN. And it is made up of a wide variety of disciplines. So it's not always the traditional aeroastronautical or space science, um, young emerging professional. It's also emerging professionals that are in English, they're in history, they're in philosophy. They're, these, are, these are people who are brought together by their interest in space. Um, and so it's wonderful to interact with them. Um, and they have got frankly, networks that at our age, if I could comment on our age, Eric's the youngest one on the stage, but um, if I comment on our age, we didn't have, right? I mean, growing up, the ability to make the kinds of the connections that are now, uh, now available over um, social networking and a lot of other different means. So I have no idea what the size of their network is, but it's tremendous. Um, and they have been very active. As a matter of fact, I just got pinged about last week from them saying, okay, we've got some white papers teed up, we wanna get to you. And, and, and when they do white papers, they're collaborating across industries, they're collaborating across disciplines, they're collaborating across countries, okay, and wanna get these white papers to us. And so we're really look, interested in having them. But basically we're opportunistic. Uh, this is one of those things that, again, if people have ideas about how we can continue to do outreach, this is for the entire country. This is not just about the talking to ourselves inside the bubble, to your point. So thank you for the question. No, that's great to hear. And it's, it sounds like you're not just focusing on rockets and habitats, all yeah. the different technologies and requirements. So thank you. Hi. Good morning. Thanks again for trying to tackle these hard problems that are setting the future for the space and um, when you talk about, last week I was at a satellite and we were talking about 160 new launch vehicles coming on board from non-traditional space actors in emerging space countries. And when you think about standards or spectrum, are, are you guys coordinating with these types of at, like international and global groups? And if you ever wanted to reach back, uh, I would encourage you guys to reach out to AAA SmallSat TC for like spectrum because this has been a problem that we've been talking about for, for a few years right now. Uh, regarding the spectrum issue, again, we're, we're sponges on, on this one. We're taking it from every direction we can get um, because we know how critical of an issue it is. Um, on the, the emergence of these, the, the tremendous emergence of these small launch uh, community, um, we, standards have come up a little bit in the discussion, but it's more focused on what we're doing as organiza individual organizations. And I know there, there are, are several different organizations that are trying to uh, standardize, you know, and, and create and establish standards. And, and we personally have been working with um, a standards writing organization, uh, but it's a challenge. You know, it, it, the, the number, uh, yeah, I guess, did you just say 160? Uh, uh, that was the number I, I was saying. Yeah, and the last I was on, it was like 114. I'm tracking about 12 or 15 of them that are really bending metal, but it is, it's growing every day. 
uh, the amount of uh, launch companies that are coming out there. So it is exciting, but and and that also touches on you know the national security issue, and, and which um, Admiral Ellis heads up, and the questions that they have um, because as as we, this is a, a driver of economic growth and the the the. Uh, the the creation of this enormous small set industry, um, but there also comes threats with that. And I, I think from both perspectives, we have to look at that. That's a great question though. Dave, do you have thoughts on that? They founded what should be noted the first commercial launch company. Um, so do you have thoughts about like just reaching out to that broader community? Uh, <laughs> where do you start? Where do you start? Stump. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, no. <laughs> no particular ones, no. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, hi, um, thank you first of all for such a great uh, multi-stakeholder um, panel and collaboration. Um, I'm Tatiana Indino with Mission to Mars Academy. Uh, we are a Silicon Valley based um, accelerator and we work with universities, national accelerators and entrepreneurs in different countries, facilitate international collaboration between startups. So um, my question is, how can this global community of entrepreneurs uh, be engaged in National Space Council? Uh, how can they participate uh, and in potentially contribute to this uh, Moon 2024 mission or Mars 2033? What are the particular avenues, how they can be engaged and submit their projects and initiatives and how they can get some support? Because uh, speaking of investors in Silicon Valley, what we see that the story with traditional investors today that they tend to invest uh, in a project with immediate business monetization while many space-related uh, initiatives are longer term, more social impact, almost non-profit uh, projects that do not really fall in this category of traditional startup investment. That's why we feel it will be really great for those projects to receive support from governmental organizations. And so what are the particular ways to um, collaborate with this community? Well, I would first point out that uh, of the two dozen or so members of the Users Advisory uh, Council, four or five are um, uh, either current or in the past have been space entrepreneurs. So the, the, the viewpoint of, from a new venture standpoint is, is, is pretty well represented on, the, on our group. As Mary Lynn said, we are uh, eager to uh, here, the best ideas uh, from, from uh, all sources for how we can advance uh, uh, our country's uh, aspirations in, in space, and certainly from the, uh, the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial sector, we're uh, very eager to uh, understand uh, what the uh, views are with respect to new markets and new technologies that are evolving there. But you're right, uh, fundamentally, whether it's space or, or something completely unrelated, uh, you've, got to, you've got to take into account, uh, just like we have to deal with the laws of physics, we also have to deal with uh, the principles of economics and uh, the ne ne necessity to uh, have projects that are, that, uh, are gonna return uh, at least the cost of their capital over their lifetime, and that makes uh, things that are more than a decade in the future pretty tough sells. Uh, so I would suggest uh, looking at uh, uh, the examples of uh, some other um, new ventures that have comparable uh, time scales. For instance, uh, commercial uh, nuclear power comes to mind as a, a pretty capital intensive relatively long-term investment area that is attracting a fair amount of private capital. Uh, a lot of that, though, uh, is coming not so much from traditional venture investors as from um, uh, individuals that have done well in other fields and are now uh, uh, setting aside a certain fraction of their uh, personal wealth to these longer-term uh, projects. So I think that's likely to be where uh, at this stage of the game, you're most, uh, uh, you're, you're, you have the best chance of finding uh, um, early stage uh, capital for projects that span multiple decades. And just to add on that, you know, we've seen um, 
a, a lot of, yeah, as I mentioned, the Silicon Valley models, and, and as, as Dave uh, highlighted really well, a lot of these are um, uh, on the investors that have made, made well in other uh, industries. Uh, Mr. Bezos comes to mind, uh, who's putting his money in his own company. But uh, there's several angel investors out there that we see, and I, I work with the, uh, the Space Angels Network, uh, just as an example, um, and some of their their investors are, are really serial investors, uh, with the knowledge that you know they, they probably won't get a return on the investment, but it's the satisfaction that they have of investing in some of the, these startup companies and giving that that boost. And uh, sometimes when, when you go out and you meet with these entrepreneurs, it's their third or fourth startup company, uh, and I always just assume that you know the first three or four were all successes and they moved on, but you know, probably. You know they weren't, but they they're keeping at it, and and they uh, they have an investment uh, line that comes in. And um, again, I, I know one person who's invested in over 45 companies, not not a you know in the the, the billionaire range, but he he's made a good fortune and, and continues to invest in it because he sees the um, uh, the upside to that. So, and I'd also add from an international perspective, you know, keep your eyes open. Uh, you know, in October here in Washington as the IAC comes to town. Um, because I think you're going to see with the, uh, uh, the the whole hoopla of the, the 50th anniversary uh, of Apollo and to the moon missions, I think um, you're going to see a, a wider aperture of the, the engagement with the international community. So I think mm -hmm. that's Thank you so much. I know NASA has a small grants program for businesses and entrepreneurs that was mentioned here. Um, if you could point us to some other sources of governmental support for startup initiatives in space, so that would be great. Okay. Hey. <clears throat> no comment. <At> the, <laughs> All right, no comment. At the uh, user advisory group meeting last month at uh, Space Symposium, there was some discussion about the group playing a role in reviewing NASA's exploration plans, serving as sort of like a red team or something. Has there been any evolution in how that would work in terms of evaluating um, the technology and the budgets and so on, and how that would avoid duplication of, say, what the NAC would do uh, for that review? That, that was less. Less is planned. Yeah, I can I can take I can talk a little bit about it. Um, so, the the discussion about um, defining, f first of all, what happened. The space symposium discussion was about really putting together what we call a term of reference, a tour, which is essentially a work statement, basically. Um, and you reported accurately, actually I read carefully, that the discussion, thank you, um, that the discussion was actually about proposing that this tour be written as opposed to proposing the red team be done, right? Which was, so, so the tour has been written um, and the way that it is being defined right now is to put together subject matter experts who exist inside the UAG. And there are several, as you know, um, there's some sitting right here on the stage. We also have uh, astronauts who have been involved in the program for a long time, and then others who have a great deal of, of expertise. Um, and to put together that group and then essentially ask NASA to come in and present what the planning is. As you also know, the planning has been um, has gone through a bit of a change uh, since that space symposium meeting, given the decision to attempt to accelerate everything until 2024. So I can't speak for Les Lyles, General Lyles, who's chairing that subcommittee, but I would imagine that we're prepared to give NASA a bit of time um, to catch up with itself uh, with regard to all this planning activity that's been going at a, just a frantic pace um, inside the agency right now before we do it. But that's where we are at the moment. Well, listen, I want to thank you again uh, for your questions and for your interest, and I also want to thank uh, the panelists that were so... Um, so I'm so grateful uh, that you were able to come here and, and represent and, and help discuss this. So thank you. Thank you.